okay. That's okay. Then. Very nice. Go and have some fruit. Yeah. Some fruit. Because I understand.
But I want to talk about broad concepts, so I'm not trying to be precise. And so, especially when you're talking about Protestants, there's so many different kinds that you really, it's almost impossible to generalize. And even among Catholics, there's lots of different ideas in Catholicism. Um, but I feel like I have to, I'm just trying to draw the basic, some, some basic concept that makes Western Christianity is different from Orthodoxy. And um, as I'm saying that, I'm not trying to bash anybody, certainly not individual people. I've been teaching in the university where I have virtually every kind of students, everything. Atheists, Hindus, Muslims, Protestants, Catholics, some Orthodox, but mostly not. Every kind of Buddhist, you name it. Every kind of student is a university. And, um, you know, what we recognize here is that we're not talking about individual persons, but their faith group, what they teach. This is what we're talking about here. I'm not suggesting that the Orthodox are better, better than anybody else, or that other people can't be saved, so don't read that into what I'm saying. But I do think we need to make uh, general statements. And other people, especially other Christians, there's something, we're not saying they have nothing. They have something. St. Paul said, no one can say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. And actually, that's a very orthodox perspective. There was one of the early, early fathers of the church, his name was Justin Martyr. And he said, whatever is true in the world comes from Jesus Christ, the Logos. And the idea is, spedemati was Logos. Then the Logos, whatever is true in other religions comes from Christ. Now, we don't take that and say that means they're fine the way they are. They don't need Jesus Christ or they don't have the fullness of the faith. What we have is the fullness of the faith. Sometimes people don't like it when I talk about other religions. But I'm here to do that and I'm not going to make any apologies for it. If I go to a Mormon war to hear a Mormon, I have to go on to hear Mormons talk about the book of Revelation, that's my area especially, I expect them to hear them talk about why they're right. Why they are the truth? Why would you go on to religion if you didn't think it was the truth thing? So I'm making no apologies for this, but <clears throat> I'm not intending to be offensive, but I can't help it. So hopefully that won't, you won't be feel offended by what I say, but just consider where you are and who's speaking to you. And you know, that should answer the question. If I go out of Baptist church, I expect to hear Baptist talk about the Baptist. Okay, so that's what I do. I'm not trying to attack people, that's fine. And uh, I did have one lady say to me, well, why can't we just talk about what we have in common? Well, that's not going to help us to understand each other. There are things that we obviously have in common as Christians, but we're here to understand what we don't have in common. I'm not trying to be dismissive, but it's not useful if we just give platitudes. So um, I, I, I want to tell you that I do know I didn't bite my tongue. I went to Rome with my son. <laughs> And we went on the Vatican tour, or the Vatican Museum tour. And I had to listen to the tour guides give their spiel. And they always start with, who was the first pope? Peter! And I'm like, Peter was not a pope. He was not even a bishop. He was an apostle, which is actually higher than a bishop. But I can bite my tongue when necessary. But this is my time to talk. Not to hold back. So leave on. Let's go on. So, I want you to understand that there were certain historical developments that took place in the West that shaped Western Christianity and took it on an entirely different path from the East. Now, the first thing, of course, is the influence of St. Augustine. This has become very well known recently. Now, it's not his fault, and it doesn't mean he's not a saint, he's not a father. We don't have to go to extremes. We just have to understand that St. Augustine was the first person to use reason and human reasoning and logic to arrive at theological explanations. And this was because he was not a trained theologian. He was a philosopher. He was a, rhetor a professor of rhetoric before he became a Christian. So he was, because he didn't have a theological education, the way Basil did it with the Gregories and Chrysostom, they were trained in theology and biblical interpretation. Augustine was not. So very often he didn't know how to answer a question. And so he began to rely on his philosophical training and 
and used human reasoning. Step by step by step, he arrived at some conclusion. And he came to believe that this is correct. So this is the foundation of all Western theology. Faith and reason. And this is very big in the Catholic Church. Faith and reason. Faith and reason. Faith and reason. And Augustine's thinking was this. God gives man faith, and he also gave us the ability to reason. And so if you reason correctly, you will arrive at the right conclusion. Well, we're going to talk about why what's wrong with that. So Augustine was very important in the West. He wrote in Latin, and so he became very dominant. He also wrote more books than any other father of the church. So he completely dominated the Latin side of the church. Now, when the church began, everybody was speaking Greek, pretty much. Okay? After the time in Palestine, but even in Palestine, many people spoke Greek. But Greek became the dominant language of the church, and it was for a long time. But around the year 200, Latin becomes to be the dominant language in the West. Now you might have said this Roman Empire, everybody's speaking Latin. But that's not correct. The Romans had conquered the Greeks. And the Romans had would learn to speak Greek, and they adopted Greek philosophy, and Greek theater, and Greek architecture, and Greek language. So the, the Roman Empire, really, they really spoke Latin, not too many places, when the church began. Then, around the year 200, we see Latin dominating in places like Italy and Gaul and North Africa, where today we have Libya, and that's what we mean by North Africa, not Egypt. So, in those places, everybody was reading Augustine. And culturally and linguistically, the Roman Empire was divided between East and West, and as time passed, Eventually, the western side fell to the barbarian invaders. By now, Constantine had already foreseen the problems with what could happen, how exposed Rome was to barbarian invasions. He moved the capital to the east. The eastern capital continued for another thousand years. But when the city of Rome fell, it became very isolated from the west. And the person who became, and of course it was the end of civilization, it happens of course very gradually. Civilization, culture, all of this disappeared gradually in the West. Now, we picture the Roman Empire, we know what the Mediterranean Sea looks like. We think of Rome as in the center of the Roman Empire, but actually Rome was at the edge of the civilized world. Because what was in Western Europe? There were no modern countries in Western Europe. There were no cities in Western Europe. Western Europe, we're talking about modern day England and France and Germany. These places were populated by tribes, by pagan tribes without a written language, uh, without a written alphabet, and all these different pagan dialects. So Rome was on the edge of the civilized world, except for a couple of places like in southern France and Gaul, you had some cities. In Milan, in northern Italy, that's a good-sized city. But other than that, Western Europe, as we imagine it, did not exist. Where was culture, learning, civilization, population? In the East, in places like Alexandria and Antioch, and all of Asia Minor and Greece. That's where people were. That's where civilization was. That's where the Greek language was. And so eventually what happens is the West, as they say, you're not allowed to say anymore, it's not culturally appropriate to talk about the Dark Ages, because there were still things going on in the West. But the, the West did fall into a decline that the East did not suffer. And who fills the vacuum of leadership when there's really no government in the city of Prague? Well, it's sufficient. And by the way, even before that, bishops in cities were taking on a lot of responsibilities to make sure people had to play drinking water and food, and they would literally hear court cases and things like this. But the Bishop of Rome became very important. And so we see the bishops of Rome having to step up, assume a lot more power and authority, and one of the first to really do this is Leo I, who was a bishop of Rome. And he literally uh, negotiated with Attila the Hun to prevent the slaughter of the citizens of Rome. Okay, so this was what's happening. The West was isolated from the East. So as the West, the uh, the West didn't say they didn't say, well, we've lost our empire now. We're in the Dark Ages. They didn't think like this. 
They said, we need help. They write to Constantinople. They send messages. They say, please, send us help. We need help. We need help. We need help. Well, Constantinople is fighting its own invasions or invaders, and it was too far away. So eventually, the city of Rome, the people of Rome, the, the, whatever cultural civilization was left there, began to look to Western Europe. And they developed alliances with the Frankish kingdom. They start, start to send missionaries to evangelize places like England and you know, Germany and Frisia, which is now the Netherlands. This is what happened. So they begin to diverge. And as Christianity develops in those areas, it develops quite differently. And one of the big differences is everybody looks to Rome. Because Rome is the leading city in the region. It's the leading authority. It's the only one of the really important bishops that exists in the West that actually speaks Latin. So gradually over time, the bishops of Rome, the popes, assume more and more and more authority. And it was partly necessary and partly something that they came to believe because they came to believe it was actually Leo was the very first person. This is the Leo the Great moved in about the year 450 when he the guy was negotiating with the Han. He was the first person ever to say that the words of Saint, uh, when the Lord said, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Because the rock is, the, the foundation of the church is St. Peter. This is his interpretation. So it's quite light. Okay? So, um, as time passed, they began to um, develop more and more of a sense of not the isolation, but of a kind of primacy, a kind of supremacy that was higher than what the early church had. The early church always recognized a kind of Roman primacy because it was the capital of the empire. And the way we know that that has nothing to do with St. Peter is because after Constantine builds New Rome, the city that came to be called Constantinople, that was put in second place behind Old Rome. And Constantinople was a brand new city. It had nothing to do with St. Peter or Paul or anybody else. So the point is that this is something that privacy of the church depended upon the importance of the see the importance of the city. Just like today, you know, Catholics will have cardinals, they don't have a cardinal of, you know, Pocatello Idaho. <laughs> no offense intended. But if there's a cardinal, it's going to be in a place like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. They are important because of the size and the importance of the city, culturally speaking, in terms of the, in terms of the culture, the commerce, and everything else. So, Slowly the popes increased their authority, and everybody in the West was asking them questions. What about this? What about this? What about this? And they were sending people out. So everybody answered to Rome, and they began to believe their own press. And so Rome was the most important bishop of the West. And I love that they still calls itself the Apostolic See. The Apostolic See. Well, you know what? In East, every see, every, see, every church is apostolic. And Ephesus, and Corinth, and Thessalonica, and Philippi, and Alexandria, and Antioch, everything's apostolic. All the cities in Cyprus, they're all founded by apostles. Okay? But look at how it postures itself that this is the authority. So what are the characteristics that developed in the West that shaped their fronima, besides that isolation? When I'm starting with Augustine and the isolation of the West and the East, they were no longer really talking to the East. They were reading the Eastern Fathers very much. They depended upon St. Augustine, and he shaped the Florima of the West. So the first characteristic of Western Florima is reliance on human reasoning in theology, and that's Augustine's contribution. Now, to his credit, he, did, uh, he knew that he wasn't educated, so he did the best he could, and he would say, please, if I'm wrong, correct me. He actually had a lot of humility. But there was nobody who could touch him. He was so well educated, he was so famous, very few people ever tried to correct him in anything. So the idea that you rely on human reasoning comes from St. Augustine. Now Protestants inherited that mentality because Protestants are children of the Catholic Church, whether they like it or not. They are two sides of the same coin. They agree on that premise, on that use of theology. 
And unfortunately, neither Protestants nor Catholics recognize the danger in applying individual human reasoning to answer theological questions. Now, be careful that you don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we're supposed to be illogical, or that orthodoxy is just saying, just believe, don't think about it, don't be educated. We're not saying that at all. And by the way, the average Western Christian isn't in the pew thinking legalistically about their salvation. There is a very strong sense of legalism in the Protestant world and in the Catholic world that is not palpable to them, but it's palpable to the Orthodox who interact with them or read their books, but you don't recognize it. It's like if you're used to, accustomed to a certain amount of salt, and so you don't even taste the salt. Maybe you'll add even more salt. But if a person is on a no-salt diet, they'll taste something that just normally you and say, oh, this is very, very salty. So people in the Western Christian world don't recognize how deeply legalistic their thought process is. But it is. And it's very obvious to us. And so as we go on, I'll explain it. So, did the fathers use human reasoning? Of course, the fathers were not against human reasoning, but it's different. We didn't use it, the fathers of the church did not use human reasoning to answer theological uh, questions. They were very educated, but they didn't rely on that. And so in our daily lives, if you're an engineer, you're a business person, you're an attorney, a doctor, you're a truck driver, whatever it is that you do, of course you're going to use human reasoning, but not in theology. In the church, we have to understand the limitations of human reasoning, okay? And we have to realize that our thoughts are immature and childish. They are from a, in a theological perspective. And this is part of the challenge. And this is a great challenge of orthodoxy now, especially as many people are discovering the Orthodox Church, they're reading books, and they're very confident to themselves that they know orthodoxy, but they don't have the phronema. Because in order to have the right orthodox phronema, you have to live as a member of the church. You have to be obedient to a spiritual father for many years before you really understand what it is to be orthodox. You don't just read a bunch of books and say, I understand orthodoxy. Because you're getting just the letter of the law without the spirit of the church, without understanding the truth of the church. Now, this is difficult for people because they are successful in their daily lives. Somebody's a successful businessman, a successful professional, an accountant, whatever, and they read a book and they say, I get this, I understand this, I can apply this, but really, you can't because you are a child in the faith. So when Jesus said you have to become like a little child, we think, oh, you have to be sweet and innocent. No, he's saying you have to be somebody who's willing to be guided, to be directed. You have to have humility as a little child. Now, do you remember some of your thoughts when you were a kid? Do you remember some of the things you thought were brilliant, that were very stupid or very dangerous? I personally think it's a, a wonder that anybody survived childhood <laughs> because we all did so many really ridiculous things and we thought we were so smart. I remember, literally remember being 11 and saying, I'm practically grown up. I don't like to figure things out for myself. That's how you think as a child. Okay? Sometimes you maybe had a brilliant idea and you went to one of your parents and you said, this is what I want to do. And they said, that's not a good idea. Oh, no, my parents. Have you heard that expression? The older I get, the smarter my parents get. Yeah. It's really true. Because we grow and mature. The church is like your mother. Okay, you don't want to listen to her, but she knows better. It's the truth. Okay? You have no perspective, especially if you're a new convert, you have no perspective on the spiritual life in the church. It's not your position, your place, to be giving instruction to other people or assume that because you've read some books or even a lot of books, you really understand orthodoxy. Because you're immature in the faith. And what I'm telling you, from the bottom of my heart, you should really take this seriously. The church as your mother has the long view. The church has the experience. 
The church has a maturity. The church knows better. And when it tells you do something or don't do something, even if you don't understand it, just like you didn't understand why your parents gave you certain restrictions, it's not because the church doesn't want you to, to think for yourself. It's because the church has experience. It knows what we do not know. That goes for me too, by the way. We think we know more than we actually do. This is my point. We think we're more mature in the faith than we actually are. And years will pass before you ever figure it out, if you do. And you might not, if you're arrogant. This is what happens sometimes. People are, listen, I love the fact that Congress are very enthusiastic about the faith. I love that. That's a good thing. But don't think or assume that you're smarter than the church or your spiritual father. This is why you do not rely on yourself. This is axiomatic and orthodox. You have a spiritual father that you talk to. You don't make the decisions for yourself based on something you've read because it may not apply to you at all or your situation. Remember that as you find the church and you're reading these things, the devil is working against you. He's working against you to try to undermine everything you've done to take you away from the church. And how is he going to do that? Oh, I've got this all figured out. I know what to do. I'm going to apply these canons to myself, to my life. I don't listen to listen to the priest. What does the priest know? And the priest is not orthodox enough. He doesn't wear a cassock everywhere he goes. Okay, why should I listen to him? It doesn't matter if he's been a priest for 50 years. You know, I know the canons of the church. I read them. And I'm going to apply them. That's not an orthodox funny mom. But this is what we're seeing, and this is why I'm so, uh, talking so much about internet orthodoxy. People who've never set foot in an orthodox church, but they think they're orthodox, or they've hardly ever go to church. This is not what it is to be orthodox. So the orthodox church does not use human reasoning in theology. In your private life out there and everything else, absolutely. Please, if you're an engineer, use your rational brain, okay? But in the church, in theology, we accept what the church teaches us even if we don't understand it. Because the church makes sense. Even though it's Ill, illogical to somebody else, irrational, why are you doing this? You're explaining to your family, why do you have to do this? Why do you do this? Why do you do this? Even if you don't understand it, we know that by following this process, this is how you become a saint. Now, a really good ex uh, example of this is the movie, The Karate Kid. You know, we know the movie, The Karate Kid. So there's this kid who wants to learn about, you know, how to fight somebody with karate. So he goes to this old Japanese fellow and he says, I want to learn karate. He says, Japanese says, fine, that's fine. Okay, but first you have to paint the fence. Paint the fence and just use up and down strokes. Go like this, up and down, up and down, up and down. So the kid does it. Okay, I've I painted the fence. Okay, now, you have to wax the car, but you have to go like this. Wax the car with right hand, and then on this side with the left hand. So the kid is really feeling like he's being abused or he's being taken advantage of, really, by this old gentleman. And he's promised to teach him karate, but he's not learning karate. He's just learning how to do this with the paint, and how to do this with the wax. And then the man starts to teach him karate. And then he learns that when somebody goes to attack you, you go like this. And then you go like this, and you go like this, and you go like this. He learned the tools first, and then he learned how to apply them and why they're important. So, unless you're living the life, you don't understand this as an Orthodox Christian. You can have all kinds of good knowledge, but it doesn't matter. We don't use human reasoning in theology because it's not apostolic. It is fallen. It's individualistic. It's fallible. It changes with the human culture and the times, whereas theology is about timeless truths, eternal truths. And we don't use human reasoning because God doesn't think the way we do. If God thought the way we do, he would never have uh, chosen the cross as the instrument of our salvation. And the other problem with human reasoning, which is it's a wonder to me why the West doesn't see this, is that the conclusion you arrive at depends entirely upon the premises you start with. You assume certain things. And so human reasoning results in a large number of different opinions. That's why the Protestants are so fractured. That's why the Catholics are so fractured. Because the Catholic Church is very, very divided.
divided in its theology and its spirituality. So, the first problem is in the West is reliance on human reasoning. Secondly, they rely a lot on documents and definitions because if you believe that you can comprehend everything and uh, uh, explain it with your human brain, you should be able to define it. And so there's lots and lots of documents and definitions and uh, human language being used to express very precisely certain human uh, concepts. So this is very common, of course, especially in the Catholic Church. And then there's also this era of legalism that was always part of the West. It became stronger in the Catholic Church. And so there are formulas, there are definitions for exactly what you must do, how you should behave. There are legal loopholes. There's all kinds of requirements. If you want somebody who's going to become a saint, there's very specific procedures for how to make somebody a saint. And these kinds of things that are very foreign to the Orthodox. So, again, it's legalism. The Catholic Church says no divorce, but you can get a no match. And I have students because I taught at Catholic University for 20 years and in Catholic graduate school of theology for nine years. I had a lot of students, and one fellow came up to me and said that he's going to get married. He had been married before, and he got an annulment. So how, he had been married for 30 years. Okay, and annulment means that the marriage never happened. It was never valid. So it's like, that's how they get around it. So it's really a lie to say there's no divorce in the Catholic Church. You just have to get an annulment, but you have to go through all these hoops. And they, they interview people, and they ask questions, and they look for some technicality because a marriage is based on the consent of two people. It's not a sacrament the way we think of a sacrament. You have two people have to, to consent to be married. They create a legal contract. You have to find something wrong with a legal contract. And so they examine all the things, and then they find some little details and say, you see, you didn't give valid consent. Okay, we can annul the marriage. Doesn't matter if they were married and had three kids, you know. That doesn't matter. So this is legalism, okay? The fiducia supplicants, if you heard about the recent declaration, declaration of, the, of the Vatican allowing for the blessing of couples in irregular relationships, same-sex couples, divorced couples, you can bless, a priest can bless, but there are very strict guidelines. Uh, they say this is not a change, there's nothing new here, the Catholic teaching on marriage hasn't changed, but now priests can bless same-sex couples. And if it's and spontaneous, if the prayer is short, if it's not a liturgical setting, so they carve out very narrow exceptions. This is not a blessing of the sin, of the behavior, it's just a blessing of the people. Well, and we're only blessing what's good in their life, we're not blessing the sin. As if you could just bless a very limited part of somebody's life. This is legalism. It's the best recent example that we have of the legalism of the Catholic Church. Oh, by the way, there's another one which you, I'm sure, would not, would not know. My students didn't know this. When you go to confession in the Catholic Church, this is why you don't assume that we're like the Catholic Church. We're actually nothing like the Catholic Church, except in a couple of outward forms. We have bishops, we have priests, we have the churches. Other than that, we're completely different. So in the Catholic Church, the, sacrament, the confession that they call the sacrament of penance, the whole sin is not forgiven. The sin is divided between the guilt of the sin and the punishment, that they call the penal consequence. When you go to confession in the Catholic Church, the guilt is forgiven. That, that is what keeps you away from God, but not the punishment. You still have to pay for that sin in purgatory. That's amazing. Why? Because the thinking is you must give, you have to pay, you have to be punished for the sin. And so this is very legal. But we don't have that. We say the priest says, having no further care for the sins you have committed, go in peace. You're never supposed to think about even the sins you confess. You're never supposed to talk about what you confess in the Orthodox Church. It's, it is as though it never happened. So, now, where do we see this kind of legalism? It, it comes out in the concept of salvation. So in the West, they will say, what do I have to do to be saved? There is a legalistic Define response to that question. What do I have to do to be saved? If you're Catholic, they all know exactly what they have to do to be saved. You have to die in the state of grace. Well, what's that? 
Well, guilt it means that you have to die, not having left any sin unconfessed. That's a mortal sin. Well, what's a mortal sin? That's defined too. And everybody knows what it is, or they know where to find it, because there's an official catechism that defines all these things. So they have in their mind, all I have to do is die in a state of grace. Now, you're going to go to purgatory anyhow for all the little sins. What about Protestants? Well, they know exactly what to do to be saved, but they're all a little bit different. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Sometimes you have to say the sinner's prayer and then maybe speak in tongues. And there's all, but everybody knows within their own little group exactly what you must do to be saved. This is legalism. Orthodoxy doesn't give any definitions for salvation or what it takes to be saved. And we're going to talk about that. So, the other thing that we see that's different in the West is the sense of authority. Who or what holds authority in the West? For Protestants, it's the Bible. But it's not really the Bible. It's the Bible as interpreted by Pastor Bob, you know, Joel Osteen, Billy Graham, Robert Schuller, remember him? You know, it's, it's the Bible as interpreted by this person. Martin Luther, etc. For Catholics, they would say that the church has authority, but it's really not the church. It's the Pope. It always comes down to the Pope. The church, the Pope is the church. So whatever the church or the magisterium says, that's the teaching bishops of the church, that is authority. And Catholics are obligated to accept it, to assent to it. We don't have anything like that, especially the Greeks, for goodness sake. We don't like to be told what to do. That's for sure. Okay? Doesn't go over very well. But it's actually in the Catholic Catechism. I had this lady write to me, who used to listen, I don't know, she still does, she didn't like what I said, she says, you're always criticizing the Catholic Church, well I'm not, unless it comes up, like, <laughs> Monday I will, because Monday we're going to talk about Matthew 16, 16, you are Peter on this block, so we're going to talk about that, but she didn't like it, and I, she said, why are you saying the Catholics are obligated to do whatever the Pope says, I said, it's in the Catholic Catechism, she didn't believe that, she didn't know that, and sometimes that happens, I said to my students, you know, when you go to confession, only part of your sin is forgiven. You still have to be punished for that. They said, no, that's not true. I had to go find it and show it to my students at the Franciscan School of Theology. These are graduate students of theology, most of whom were headed for the priesthood. They did not know that about their own faith. And I, so I brought it to class next week. I said, this is what it says. This is how, why. And there's a very legalistic explanation. It's, it's quite interesting. Actually, it's very, very interesting. But it's all on the Vatican website. You can find whatever. You can find whatever you want. Okay. Sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It's a failure in genuine love of God. It's a deed or desire contrary to eternal law. This is the official Catholic catechism. Sin is an offense against God. Now, from the website of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Okay, satisfaction for sin. Sin is an offense against God, as well as a fault against reason. Notice, about reason. Now, how do you make satisfaction for sin? You have to pay for sin. An act whereby the sinner makes amends for sin, especially in reparation to God, for offenses against him. The penance given by the confessor in the sacrament of penance contributes to such, such satisfaction. True satisfaction is participation in the satisfaction of sin made by Christ. So this is a big problem theologically. Okay, it's a huge problem theologically. But this is what, this is what it is. And, and they know this. Okay, now. So the punishment of sin. Sin! This is again, the uh, Catholic catechisms. Every sin, even venial, that's a little sin, must be purified either here on earth that is by suffering in your life, or after death in the state called purgatory. Forgiveness of sins, restoration of communion to God, entail the remission of eternal punishment of sin. But the temporal punishment remains, that means in purgatory. Now, I said this to my students, I was showing these things to them, and they, I, they said, oh, but we're Franciscans. <laughs> I said, you're Roman Catholics. There's a certain way of thinking that they have been Taught, but this is the official Catholic catechism. Okay, this is what it's saying. So when he was talking about this idea of, of legalism, so there's a, this idea that when you, um, because you you sin, 
and you've caused this offense against God, you've kind of disrupted the moral order of the universe, and now you have to make that up. And you do this by being punished. Now, so one of my students says, listen, this is a, this is a, he was also in the Franciscan school, but he memorized, he was a Lutheran, became a Catholic, and he memorized absolutely everything. He said, this is what it takes to be a mortal sin. He said, this is what I do, this is what I do, this is what I do, this, that's a mortal sin. And I just said, all sin is mortal. And it is. And St. Augustine said that, by the way, too. He said, we can either die by one giant boulder falling on us, or millions of grains of sand. Those are the little things. So orthodoxy takes into consideration all the little sins. Not saying that you have to pay for them, but because this is how we become sanctified by paying attention even to the little sins. Now, so this is the difference between our concept of sin leads to a different idea about salvation. And this is the heart of the debate between Protestants and Catholics. How are we saved? Now, if you think about it from a Protestant perspective, the way the Protestants, you know, rejected Roman teaching, the way they protested and wanted to reform the church, they are right. They're right, because if sin is a crime or an offense against God for which Jesus paid on the cross, there is nothing else for us to do. It makes perfect sense. It, of course it's wrong that the Catholic Church says, yes, Jesus died, but that's not enough. You have to go to purgatory, and you have to do this and this and this. Because what the Catholic Church says is that there is this kind of spiritual bank that's called the treasury of merit. And sometimes in the prayers of the Catholic Church, you'll hear the word merit. We don't have that concept. So what does that mean? That means you can get time out of purgatory. This is not the teaching of the Catholic Church. You can get time out of purgatory by tapping into this treasury of merit that deposits have been made by Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the saints. You can benefit from their holiness directly. We don't have that. No wonder that Protestants are against the idea of saints. With that idea, yes, I, I can benefit from the saints. We don't have that idea. I can't benefit from the holiness of another person. We use them as examples. They inspire us. We can learn how to become holy, but I can't directly get benefit from another person, even if it's a saint. But that is Catholic teaching. So, Father, can correct me if I'm wrong about anything. Please, please correct me. Father, you're on track. Father Seraphim here, who used to be Catholic, studied a lot, knew it very well. So, he's, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, there's a different idea about sin and a different idea about salvation. And the idea of sin comes primarily from one person in the West. His name was Anselm of Canterbury. Now you know about Canterbury in England, that's uh, where the you know, Anglican church is headquartered. But before the Anglicans, before they broke off, before Henry VIII broke off of the Catholic Church, that was the place of the bishop, of the Catholic bishop of England. So one of these Catholic bishops was Anselm. And he's a saint in the Catholic Church. This was about a thousand years ago. He tried to answer the question of why God became a human being, why God became man. So he wrote a very famous book called Cur Deus Ovo. Okay, so I told you the problem with human reasoning and theology is it all depends upon your, your, your conclusion depends upon the premise you begin with. So this is his premise. He starts with sin. Why did God become man? He says, sin is a crime against God or a debt that we incur, that we owe God. Okay? But the price or the debt was so high we couldn't possibly repay God. We couldn't make it right with God. Okay? Or the crime was so huge that we couldn't make it right. So only God could pay for it, but God didn't owe the debt. God didn't commit the crime. So it was something that a human being couldn't have handle, but a human being had to pay for it. So God became man to pay the price for our sin that only God could eliminate. Okay? So, this view of sin, more than anything else, has shaped Catholic and Protestant theology. It is foreign to the early church. So the answer of why God became man? God became man because only God could pay the debt or pay for the crime of a human being, of humanity. So that's why God became man. And everybody loved it because
because it's so rational. But look how it begins with a certain idea of sin. Now, do you think that Anselm of Canterbury was the very first person ever to ask the question of why God became man? Of course not. St. Athanasius also asked the same question. It's very famous. He said, God became man so that, all the Orthodox know it, you might become man, might become God. Now, do you think St. Athanasius was the first person ever to say that? Of course not. Irenaeus said something very similar. And before him, Justin Martyr, this is early, you know, second century, said something very similar. And this is within the lifetime, that they were very close to the time of the apostles. This is apostolic teaching. This is what salvation consists of. God became man so that we can become sanctified, not literally gods. This is what the Mormons are saying today. Mormons are using this to try to say, oh, we can literally become God, to buttress their idea. But when, when Athanasius says this, or Irenaeus, or any of the fathers, they don't mean we literally become God, but we can become sanctified, okay, by following Christ. Okay, now, we don't have any concept like the treasury of merit. We don't believe that, but if you, if you look at the idea of having to pay for sin, this is a very legalistic, very transactional idea of sin. Now, Protestants came along 500 years after Anselm, just think about it, in which the entire West built a whole theology of salvation based on this idea that Jesus paid for our sins. The Protestants come along and say, and rightly so, if Jesus paid for it, there's nothing left for us to do, right? Because if that's what salvation is, somebody has to pay your debt. Then Jesus paid, and they're right. There's nothing else. How can you possibly say that we could add to that? So do you see why they objected to the teaching of the Catholic Church? So they would agree with the Catholic Church about salvation. It makes sense for them to say Christ's sacrifice is enough. So what's left? Just accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Can you see how within that frame, with that conception of sin, that makes sense? But not for the Orthodox, because we don't think of sin that way. We don't think of, we don't think of salvation along those lines. Now, the problem with this idea of this is how somebody is saved is that it's actually kind of heretical. Kind of, kind of, really is, from an Orthodox perspective. Because what we're saying, if we're saying that Sin is a crime against God or an offense for which somebody had to pay, and Jesus paid for it. It's, it shows that God is the problem. Because we sinned, God got mad, and he's going to punish us, so we have to do something to appease an angry God. And this is the worst idea of God. Is some Protestants love it, you know? God the Father put all of the sins of humanity and Jesus suffered and isn't that wonderful? This is terrible. And it's not biblical, by the way. There's one verse that says why God became man. And what, what is it? For God so loved the world, what? He sent his only begotten son because he loved the world, not because he demanded that somebody pay the price for sin. That's foreign to the early church, completely foreign. But if you read the New Testament with a legalistic mentality, you find these ideas that Jesus paid for our sins, okay? Because if you say somebody had to pay, this is, there's something else that's wrong with this theologically. This means that God is under compulsion. That means God uh, can't forgive you. This is what they say, God would like to forgive you. Catholics even say no, but he can't. Because justice demands that someone pay. God can't forgive you. When you talk, it's God. <laughs> it's God. Okay? That's not true. But look, it places God under compulsion. It makes God like a human being. It lowers him down. God does not become angry when we sin. He doesn't, he's not up there saying, I'm looking down, oh, Dr. Constantino, oh my goodness. Boy, am I mad at her. Look at what she did. You know, she ate too many cookies yesterday. She's, you know, yeah, seriously. 
God does not become angry. This is biblical language that is used for, uh, to help us understand something about God. Okay? So the early church understood as said primarily as illness, and this is still the model of the Orthodox Church. This is why we talk about Christ as a physician of our souls and bodies. And by the way, that's very, very early church. So, you know, we describe sin as an illness, not legalistically. Now, do the fathers ever describe sin as a crime against God or death? Yes, they do. They use that image. But they don't construct a whole system of salvation based on this idea that we have to pay. Now, what usually happens at this point is that Protestants will object. They will say that Jesus' death is a sacrifice. Okay, he paid with his blood. Yes, of course. The New Testament says Jesus' death is a sacrifice. But is this what was happening? What does this mean? They presume that sacrifice equals payment. Somebody had to pay. But you have to understand what sacrifice was, even in Judaism. It's in Judaism. Sacrifice is not the animals paying for your sins. The animal didn't do anything to deserve to die. Okay? Sacrifice, just think about it, because practically everybody in this room, well, everybody in this room, is either a parent or a child. Okay, so we've had parents who loved us, made sacrifices for us. We as parents made sacrifices for our children. What does that mean? It was demanded by somebody? That's not what a sacrifice is. Christ's sacrifice was an act of love. That he, that's why we constantly say, it's so important in the Orthodox Church, Christ willingly died for our salvation. He voluntarily endured the cross for us, not because it was demanded by God the Father. This makes God a monster. But he did it out of love for us. And by the way, another problem with saying that everything was accomplished by Jesus' death on the cross, he paid for our sins, you know, you know, he, he punched the ticket for us to go to heaven. What about the resurrection? Does that matter? What role does the resurrection play? Because Jesus wasn't left in the grave. He rose from the dead. Can you see how impoverished that theology is? Completely impoverished. So, Jesus dies on the cross out of love for us. Why the cross? is the ultimate sign of humility. And to, to accept that, is a sign of God's love, unfathomable love, that he was willing to do that. So none of us can say, well, I'm too good for that. Okay, Jesus, Jesus did everything necessary for our salvation. He gave us the ultimate example of love and humility without which we cannot be saved. So, all of those words that are translated in the New Testament from Greek, words like vikiosini, which is translated as justification, you see how that has a legalistic kind of, the word is righteousness. The word for justification, I'm justified. That's got a, a legalistic feeling to it. Atonement, that word is not in the Bible. That's an English word that's borrowed from English law. Somebody paid and he bought me or paid for something. He made, uh, he made an atonement. It's a contraction, it's a legalistic concept. That's not part of the thinking of the early church, which do Greek, and so they did translate it according to, or understand these things according to these legalistic, transactional concepts. This is God, we pay our price, we go to heaven. What do you mean? I heard this several times. Are you going to heaven? It's on the TV, right? Do you know you're going to heaven? Are you sure you're going to heaven? Anyhow, we have different ideas of heaven. Salvation in the West is going to heaven. Now look how different the Orthodox concept is. What do I have to do to be saved? You Catholic, die and save grace. Protestant, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know what to do, and you do all these things, you get in, you cross the finish line, Peter opens the gates, whatever it is, and you're in. Okay? That's not salvation for us, because what is sin? What is salvation? Salvation is eternal life in union with God. So, otherwise, what are we doing there? Okay, you ever thought about this? I'll tell you something funny. You're going to appreciate this. Because Catholic, because our Holy Week, you know, Holy Week is really intensive in the Orthodox Church. It's very tiring. It's wonderful. But it's really something. It's like 35 hours of church. 40 hours of church if you go to all the services. So, 
One year, it was, uh, we're toward the end of Holy Week, like Friday night or something. And my husband, Father Boss, says that he loves it. He says, he says, isn't this wonderful? We're at church all the time. This is what heaven is like. We're always worshiping God. And everybody's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is just, he just, he's not this high, you know. This is, this is what heaven is like. Heaven is eternal life in union with God. It's not that you arrive at a destination and you're sitting on clouds, playing harps, getting wings, or all these other silly things. It is a life in union with God. Why is that? Because God is holy. Now, this is what Catholics have purgatory. They understand that God is holy. Protestants understand that too. They don't know what to do with that. But they know that. It's true. For Catholics, because God is holy and you're going to be in the presence of God, not union with God, but you're viewing God from a distance, you have to be holy. So you have to have your plant, your sins cleansed. Burnt in purgatory, you have to suffer for your sins so you can be with God. We don't believe that. We say that it is in this life that we begin this process of sanctification. That's why we do all these things in, in church. Not because we can, believe we can earn our salvation. Because this is how slowly we prepare ourselves up for a life with God. Which if we don't begin now, we can't have it later. So what happens in the general culture? What do they say in the culture? I'm a good person. I think I'm going to go to heaven. I'm a good person. Where did Jesus ever say anything about being a good person? And what does that mean? Does anybody ever say I'm a rotten person? They never say that. Or I, I love this one. I, I'm going to heaven. I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> you know that? You know that? I haven't broken any of the Ten Commandments. As if that's the standard. First of all, the Ten Commandments are not the standard for Christians. And by the way, all of us have broken them. Okay? So this is nonsense. But this is, this is crept into the common thinking. So, salvation is life in union with God. We cannot have that if we are living a sinful life. That's why what we do here on earth matters. Not because we're earning our salvation, not because we have to do good deeds. If somebody says, and I saw this on the internet, do we have to do good deeds to be saved? That's the wrong question. What do you mean do you have to do good deeds? You're thinking legalistically. Okay, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. I have to do a fast for Lent, and I have to do my good deeds, and I have to... This is legalism. We do good deeds because we're modeling Christ. And by doing these things, we learn humility. We learn to, be, to, to appreciate what we have. We, help, we, we learn mercy. We learn that we are also under the mercy of God. So, you know, this is why we do these things. So, this, our idea of sanctification is directly tied to our idea of salvation. Now, Protestants say we can't do anything to aid our salvation because they're reacting to the Catholic idea. So if you're reacting to the Catholic idea, that's true. Jesus paid the entire price. But if sin, what if sin is not a crime or an offense against God? What if sin is a wound that we incur on our soul? Then we go to church and we say, Jesus, here's my wound, please help me, or help me to, to heal. That's what we Christ, the physical Christ, the physician of our souls and bodies. So if I explain these things to Catholics, they say, oh yeah, we have that too. We have that too. So we, we, you know, Christ is a physician, sin is a wound, uh, you know, sin is before, something that is a d departure from God. Uh, this kind of a thing. Sin is a he, he, you know, spiritual illness. Um, they'll say, yeah, now we have that too. But the whole theology of the Catholic Church is built on something else. And they try to incorporate all these different things that don't belong together. And they don't recognize that it's inconsistent. So sin is not, if sin is not a crime or death for which someone had to pay, then salvation is different. And so as Orthodox, we think differently. Okay? We don't believe that there's a definition. There's, and people don't like this. And what happens sometimes with, with um, converts is they're very enthusiastic and they say, okay, what do I have to do? And then you bring it to the Orthodox Church, your legalistic mentality, your rational mind, and you're saying, okay, it's like, Father, tell me how to fast. Or you, worse off, 
You read a book. Okay, this is what, what they say in this book. Or this is how a certain saint fasted, so I'm going to do that. And you're all in. And one of my friends described it perfectly. She said, I never exactly know what to do. She come from a Protestant mind. So she was always trying to fit all of the concepts into this neat structure and make sure that everything matched and made sense and she could check off all the boxes intellectually about the Orthodox faith. And then when it came to her spiritual life, she had an idea of what she had to do. And so she said, I have my daily prayers, I have my meditation, my Bible reading, my kids, my fasting, whatever it is, go to church, whatever it is. She said that at the end of the day, if she did everything she was supposed to do, she felt proud. Well, that's not good. <laughs> but if she didn't, she felt shame, okay, guilty, that she didn't accomplish everything she was supposed to do. She, maybe she went to Costco and had a meatball. With a little salad. It was a Friday. So she felt guilty. Have you ever, you know, have to remember when you're in Costco. Apples and apples. You have one here, but I don't. And they have all those apples. I think, what day of the week is? Is that, oh, oh, can't have that. Okay. She said she was vacillating between guilt and pride. Exactly right. Not supposed, until she realized that orthodoxy is not about doing all these things so that we can get to heaven. Okay. We're doing these things so that we can shape ourselves. And this is the beauty of being in a parish where you have cradle orthodox. For all of you out there who are converts to the faith. You have people over here who have been in the faith for a long time. So you might come and say, oh, I forgot it was Friday and I went to Casa and I ate a meatball. And I'll say, that's okay, but not keep going. That's okay. <laughs> Orthodoxy is very relaxed. We're not uptight. Especially the Greeks. Definitely not up top. <laughs> Relax. Now, I'm not saying that this means it doesn't matter. I'm just saying we don't get all worked up over things because we're not approaching the faith legalistically. We know we're in it for the long haul, and the church it sort of accepts us in all of our faults and failings, okay? Here is why we don't create uh, rules for what you have to do to be saved, or actually a definition of what you have to do to be saved. Because Jesus didn't say you have to die in a state of grace. Jesus never said just say the sinner's prayer or pray the sinner's prayer. Jesus never said you're saved by faith alone. As a matter of fact, Matthew 25 is exactly against that, right? So what does the New Testament say about how we have to be saved? What do we have to do to be saved? It says, these are some of the things it says. This is why the Orthodox Church doesn't give you a formula. It says, believe in Christ. Be baptized, keep the commandments, love one another as Christ loved us, we have to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick, pick up our cross and follow him, love no one else more than him, including parents and children and spouses. We have to repent, have a pure heart, help and thirst after righteousness, be merciful, sell everything we have and give it to the poor, not judge others, love our enemies, forgive everyone, confess our sins, become like a little child, practice humility. Those are some of them. So when a Protestant says, this is what you have to do, just accept Jesus Christ, that's not biblical. They say, we're not biblical, seriously? This is what, we try to do all of these things. Not because Jesus didn't complete our salvation by dying and rising from the dead, but that we know that to have eternal life in union with God, we have to become sanctified. So we can't answer the question, are you saved? Christ said many, many things. Okay? So, why make salvation so complicated? Why can't we just come up with something? It's contrary to the Orthodox mind to be able to do that. We just can't do it. We're not legalists. But also because, for the two basic reasons. Number one, this is what we received from the apostles. We didn't get a checklist for salvation from the apostles. They gave us this, a whole way of life and a whole way of thinking. And the other reason why we don't have requirements that we're supposed to meet is because this is better for us. It's better for us. Why? Because if you say, I've done all this, I'm in a state of grace, or I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I know I'm going to heaven, then what does that mean about all those other people? They're not. Right? Because they haven't met your standard, a human standard. But Christ does not give us these standards. He doesn't give us one clear thing. He 
tells us many things. So that we can, there are lots of ways to be saved. Not just, not just by being baptized, not just by helping the poor, not just by, you know, loving your neighbor. All of these things matter. Because what we're trying to do is shape our soul to conform to Christ. You see? And that's honest. So orthodoxy is honest about what it takes for our salvation. But that means we can also accept people on all different paths. You don't have to be perfect in this life. You have to be trying. So that's why it's not right to say, somebody said, I don't have to be baptized. Why not? Because the thief on the cross went to paradise and he wasn't baptized. Legalism. Rationalism. Right? Well, it's possible to be saved without being baptized. That's true. But the Lord looks at all of the circumstances of our life and decides. But when we say, well, I'm not going to be baptized, it's like that I wasn't baptized. You for sure are not going. Okay? I shouldn't even say that. Was Hitler, did Hitler go to heaven? Could he have repented? It's possible. That's why people say, well, I don't know if I should pray for this person because they died in a very sinful state. We don't know. This is so important that we understand in orthodoxy. We accept everyone where they are. That doesn't mean we accept sin. But we don't make judgments about people. And this is the beauty of orthodoxy. And as, after we come back and watch, I'll explain to you how this works in daily life. But I'm going to leave you with this thought. St. Simeon, the new theologian, said, we never say that someone is going to hell. Never. Even if we see that person sin, and it's a serious sin, why not? Because, he said, because we don't know how hard they fought against the sin before they fell. See, Jesus thinks about that too. And we don't know how much they repented of it later. Only God knows the heart. That's why we don't make these rules, so that we don't become complacent in our spiritual life. I'm going to sin with grace, I have nothing to worry about. That's what my students used to say to me. They would say, well, at least if I'm in purgatory, I know I'm going to get out. We don't have that. We have, we're, our, our system is past fail. Okay. But you don't know the outcome. We're supposed to continually be trying. So I'll stop and let you all have your, have your lunch. Father, are you going to say the prayer for what? Uh, Father, 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 Father. Father. Praise the God, bless the food and the drink of us, thy servants, without holy now and ever to ages of ages. Amen. Amen.